Good morning, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Individual Impacts of Tax Reform. We'll be getting started shortly, but first, I wanted to take a couple of minutes to go over the format of today's webinar. If you are attending this webinar for CPE credit, you must answer the three polling questions that are presented during the webinar, along with completing the post-webinar survey that will be sent out tomorrow with the recording and slides. All phones have been placed on mute for this webinar. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use the questions tab in the menu. We will address questions at the end of the webinar as time permits. We will also be recording this session and the recording will be sent out tomorrow following the webinar. Again, thank you for joining us. At this point, I would like to introduce our presenters. As a partner in the tax department, Tim Berry directs tax return preparation services and develops planning strategies for the firm's private client group. Tim works closely with business owners, executives, and high net worth families on tax matters, including equity compensation, real estate ownership, multi-generational tax planning, and philanthropic planning. Tim is also heavily involved in the firm's trust and estate group, working with individuals and fiduciaries on year-end and longer-term gift, estate, and trust planning issues. As a manager in Bloom Shapiro's tax group, Lauren Gates has over 15 years of tax planning and compliance experience. She is a member of the firm's estate and trust group, where she provides training and education regarding trust and real estate, and I'm sorry, and estate concepts. Lauren works closely with individuals, families, and estate professionals on individual fiduciary and gift tax issues and represents tax clients before the Internal Revenue Service and state taxing authorities. As a manager in our tax department, Miao Chu focuses in the estates and trusts area. As a member of the estate and trust planning group, she provides tax planning and compliance services related to gifts, trusts, estates, and high net worth individuals. She specializes in estate planning and high net worth individual taxation. I will now hand it over to Tim to begin today's webinar. Well, thank you, Jared, and good morning, everyone. We're gonna start our presentation with a heartfelt welcome in the form of a legal disclaimer. And let me just summarize what this says. Uh, basically, you can't rely on anything that we say today and if you do, then you can't sue us. So now that we feel a little bit closer together as a group, why don't we start on with our material? Our agenda today is deceivingly short, but please don't be fooled. There's quite a bit of material that we're gonna be covering uh, this morning. I'm gonna start off with talking about some changes in the tax rates, calculations, and credits. And then Miao is going to talk about some very significant changes in our deductions. And Lauren is going to run the anchor leg and talk about a myriad of other important changes impacting individual taxpayers. A couple points I'd like to make up top here. Uh, first of all, other than a brief mention on this first slide, I'm not going to discuss the 20% qualified business income deduction or the QBI deduction. Uh, that deduction, even though it's um, taken at the individual level, the rules are so complicated that we felt that it warranted its own separate webinar. And that webinar was held last week. We recorded it, and it is available on our website, so you can listen in on that at your convenience. Uh, the second thing is, unless we tell you otherwise, all of the provisions we talk about today are temporary which means they're only in the law from 2018 through 2025. And unless Congress takes action, the old rules will come back into play starting in 2026. So let's talk about the uh, changes in the tax rates. Unlike the huge decrease that we had in the corporate tax rates, our reduction in the individual tax rates are much more modest. We still have seven graduated tax brackets for individuals. They run from 10% up to 37%. And you can see those brackets under both the old law and the new law at the top of this slide. In addition to a reduction in the rates, however, the size of the brackets themselves are wider. And what that means is that a greater percentage of income will be taxed at lower tax rates. As an example of the wider brackets, if you look at the bottom of this slide, this shows us the start of the top tax bracket for various filing statuses. 
And if we look just at the married filing joint column, which is the one to the left, MFJ, you can see that under the old rules in 2017, the top tax bracket was reached when taxable income hit $470,000. And that was the 39.6% bracket. Under the new tax law in 2018, the top tax bracket has been reduced to 37%, and that bracket won't be hit until taxable income is $600,000. So all else being equal, if you have the same taxable income in 2017 and in 2018, you'd have a lower tax. Now, these decreases in the brackets have been built into the withholding tables, so for those who are getting W-2s, their withholdings will be less in 2018 because of these changes in the tax rates. Now here's my brief um, mention of the QBI deduction. When Congress put this qualified business income deduction into the law, they really intended it to act as a rate reduction attributable to that qualified business income. So while you may not be too excited with the decreases in the tax rate shown on this slide, if you are able to take the QBI deduction, your effective tax rate will be a larger reduction. On the next slide, let's take a look at some of the things that aren't changing. The preferential tax rates on long-term capital gains and qualified dividends, they remain the same. So we still have a 0%, 15% and a 20% tax rate attributable to that income. The net investment income tax, the 3.8% tax that was placed in, um, into the law a few years ago as part of the Affordable Care Act, that still applies. As well as our Medicare surcharge, 0.9% on wages and self-employment income exceeding a certain threshold, that's still in play as well. And then the marriage penalty relief. Um, there is a marriage penalty that is inherent in the tax brackets for married taxpayers. Um, that's still there. However, the new law did mitigate that a little bit, and now the penalty only applies for taxpayers who are in the upper two tax brackets. Next slide. The alternative minimum tax, the dreaded AMT. The AMT was repealed. For individuals, there was talk cooperate early on that they would repeal the individual AMT as well. However, the final law did not repeal it. So we still have an individual AMT. But there are three reasons why how AMT is going to be much less of an issue for taxpayers going forward. And the first reason is that we have an increased exemption. Think of the exemption as kind of like a standard deduction um, against your AMT tax. To the extent you have an exemption, you have less AMT income and therefore have a lower AMT tax. Well, the AMT exemption increased quite significantly. For married filing joint taxpayers, it was about $84,000. Now it's $109,000. And secondly, this, phase, this exemption phases out. Under the old rules, the phase out began when your AMT income was about $161,000 for married filing joint taxpayers. Now it doesn't start phasing out until your AMTI income hits a million dollars. So not only do you get a larger exemption, but you also have a better chance of using that exemption. And finally, as Miao will speak, there are fewer deductions for regular tax purposes and therefore fewer addbacks for AMT purposes. So if you look at the combination of these three changes, you'll see that fewer taxpayers will be subject to AMT going forward. And in fact, some people who have been carrying forward AMT credits for a number of years may finally be able to start using those credits in 2018. So I guess it's safe to say that individual AMT is not dead, but it has been severely weakened. The kitty tax. This is the tax on unearned income of children. 
Unearned income defined as mainly investment income, interest, dividends, capital gains. Uh, children defined as um, children who are under age 19 or if they're full-time students um, up to the age of 23. And under the old rules, if you had children with unearned income in excess of $2,100, that excess was taxed at the parent's marginal tax bracket. And there was a form 8615 that needed to be completed and included in the child's tax return. And on that form 8615, there was income uh, relating to the uh, parent's tax bracket the um, unearned income of other children in the family. So it was kind of this horrible coordination amongst family members in order to finish a child's return. And you couldn't finish the child's return until the parent's return was completed. Um, you also had kids, you know, kind of flipping through their returns and seeing what their parent's tax rate was and then trying to renegotiate their allowances with the parents. So it was a, a major mess. The new rule has um, taken care of that um, because now under the new rule, the unearned income of a child is now going to be taxed under the trust tax rule. So you, the good news is you no longer have to coordinate between family members. Uh, the bad news is that the child may end up having a higher tax on, them, on their unearned income because the trust tax rates are much more compressed than the individual rates. Another big change is in regards to the child tax credit. And in fact, a lot of families are gonna find that most of the tax decrease under the new rule is going to be attributable to this child tax credit change. The child tax credit itself has been in the law for several years. It applies to children who are under age 17. And the credit used to be $1,000 per qualifying child. Under the new rules, the credit has increased to $2,000 per qualifying child. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? It's only $1,000 difference. Well, it is a big deal for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is a credit. So it's a dollar for dollar reduction in your tax liability. Secondly, this credit is phased out. And under the old rules, for a married couple, the phase-out began when their adjusted gross income exceeded $110,000. Under the new rules, that AGI phase-out only starts when the AGI is $400,000. So many, many more families will be able to make use of this credit. And for those families, the increase really isn't from $1,000 to $2,000 per child. It's really from zero to $2,000 because they had been phased out of the old credit. If you've got a family with two kids, now all of a sudden you've decreased your tax by $4,000. Out of that $2,000 credit for qualifying children, uh, $1,400 of it can be refundable in certain circumstances. And there is also a new non-refundable $500 credit for dependents who don't qualify for the $2,000 credit. So here we're talking about dependents who are age 17 or older. So you now get a, at least a $500 credit for those dependents. For the estate and gift tax, the big change here was the doubling of the exemption. The exemption was originally slated to be $5.6 million for 2018. It's now going to be what we think $11,180,000. Now that's a per person exemption. So for a married couple, you can shelter effectively over $22 million from estate and gift taxes. So very few people in this country were subject to the estate tax to start with. Now under the new rules and the doubling of the exemption, it'll be even far fewer people subject to the tax. But you do have to worry about where you live because certain states 
have their own estate and gift taxes. For instance, in Massachusetts, we have an estate tax and the exemption is only $1 million. Uh, Rhode Island has an estate tax and I believe the exemption there is a million and a half. And Connecticut has both an estate and a gift tax, although its exemption is rapidly increasing. And I believe in 2020, the exemption will equal the federal exemption. So just because you're out of the woods for federal purposes, you do have to be concerned with state taxes that may apply. Uh, also clawback, what are we referring to here? Clawback refers to a situation where a taxpayer may take advantage of the increased exemption by making lifetime gifts. And perhaps at the end of 2025, if Congress doesn't act, the exemption may revert back to the old rules. And some taxpayers were concerned that if they had used an exemption during this, the next um, eight years here, and then Congress takes the exemption and reduces it, will they owe a tax on the excess exemption that they used? And the answer is, we don't think so. And it's not Congress's intent for that to happen, but we're still waiting for some clarification and confirmation of that. Importantly, the basis step up rules still apply. So even though you may not be subject to the federal estate tax anymore, you still are able to step up the basis of your property and avoid capital gains when your heirs sell that property. And as a result, what's really happening here for a lot of taxpayers is they're switching from estate tax planning to income tax planning. And over the many, many years, people have been trying to push property out of their taxable estate. Well, for some people, they may want to pull property back into their taxable estate so that they get a step up in basis and the capital gains will go away in relationship to that property. So really what you need to do is to review your documents. Uh, these are big changes with the exemption. You wanna consult your professional. You wanna make sure that your documents still operate the way that you intended them to operate. And you also want to build in some flexibility in those documents because again, these rules are temporary as they stand now. And finally, GST exemption. Uh, the GST exemption is equal to the gift in a state exemption, so that has also doubled. And although it's beyond the scope of this presentation, there may be opportunities for taxpayers to apply, make a late allocation of GST exemptions to certain trusts so that those trusts will be GST exempt going forward. So a lot of changes here, a lot of things to be um, concerned with. Um, that is the end of my material. It will go to a poll question. Thanks, Tim. And just a reminder, if anyone is attending this webinar for CPE credit, you must answer all three of the polling questions beginning with this one. We'll leave voting open for about a minute. A few more seconds here and we'll be we'll be ending this poll. Great, thank you everyone. Hopefully I'll be able to answer some of the questions um, on the first polling question. Um, let's move on to the deduction section of the tax reform. The standard deductions is increased by almost 50% across the board for tax years 2018 to 2025, while leaving the elderly and blind unchanged. 
the standard deductions is indexed for inflation, but instead of using the old um, traditional consumer price index, it is now using what's called the chained uh, consumer price index. And what it does is a result in a lower inflation. We all know that you have to give in order to get. So with the doubling up of the standard deductions, the personal exemptions are now disallowed. Uh, in 2017, it was just over $4,000, but it is subject to income phase out. So for um, high wage earners, you might not get this personal exemption to begin with. One minor note on the personal exemption is that it might change the um, tax return filing requirement, which originally it was based on your gross income in excess of the combination of personal exemptions and standard deductions. Now, with the personal exemptions disallowed, it is now changed to your gross income exceeds just the increased standard deduction. Medical expenses. There was this um, temporary tax break that is set to expire um, at the end of 2016 that for taxpayers age 65 and older, they will be able to deduct medical expenses um, subject to um, in I'm sorry, in excess of their 7.5% of AGI instead of 10%. What the tax reform did is they retroactively extend this tax break through 2018 and made it available to any individual regardless of age. So with this said, it is only available for tax years 2017 and 2018, and it will revert back to the 10% floor beginning with 2019 and going forward. Uh, medical expenses is an add-back for AMT purposes, and the add-back follows the regular tax for that tax year, so there's no special percentage limitation for AMT purposes. Um, you might want to consider um, accelerate some of your discretionary medical expenses into this year to take advantage of this decreased limitation. Another area that got a lot of buzz is the state and local tax deduction. The tax reform capped $10,000 for marriage filing joint on state and local taxes. Um, and it includes your real estate taxes, your personal property taxes, your state and local foreign income taxes, and they might also include general sales tax, for example, if you live in a state that doesn't have income taxes. However, this $10,000 cap does not apply if these are paid or accrued by a trade or business or your other type of income producing activity. For example, if you own um, rental properties that are reported on Schedule E, the real estate taxes associated with these properties are still deductible. I remember at the end of 2017, we received a lot of questions from our clients on whether they should prepay their um, real estate taxes. The IRS has recently issued guidance on this area, um, and what they advise us is it is deductible in 2017 only if it is already assessed when you paid it, because you're not officially um, liable it, uh, for it yet until your local government assesses it. In their uh, guidance, they also gave two examples. Um, County A usually assesses their property tax in July 2017 for the fiscal year that starts from July 2017 to June 2018. And the assessment is paid uh, in two installments, with the first one due in September 2017 and the second installment due in January 2018. If the taxpayer paid the January 2018 installment in December 2017, it is deductible. Now, County B assesses their property tax on a regular schedule, but the County B's residents wanted to prepay their real estate taxes. County B revised their computer system to accept prepayment, but if the taxpayer prepay their real estate taxes for the fiscal year 2018 to 2019 property tax that's not usually assessed until July 2018, then it will not be deductible. Moving on to home equity interest. Um, this is another interesting area. 
commercially, there are two types of debts. There's your acquisition debt and there's the home equity debt. Regardless how they're labeled commercially, for tax purposes, your acquisition debt is defined as a debt that's incurred in buying, building, or substantially improving your home. And home equity debt is defined simply as it's not the acquisition debt, which is, is not used to buy, build, or substantially improve your home, even though both require that it's secured by your home. Um, in the old law, you can deduct this home equity interest regardless how the proceeds is used. But this has now changed. In the recent IRS release, um, IR-2018-32, the IRS clarifies that the interest on home equity debt is deductible only when they are used to buy, build, or improve your home, and the loan is secured by the same home. So it is as if it's treated as another acquisition debt. Um, the tax reform also enacted a loan ceiling. It is now revised from $1 million to 750,000 married filing joint, or half of that, um, 375,000 for married filing separate. In the IRS release, they gave a couple of scenarios um, to help clarify their position. Example one, John takes out a $500,000 mortgage to buy his main home. He then takes out another $250,000 home equity loan to put an addition to his main home. Both loans are secured by his main home, and because the total proceeds does not exceed $750,000, and let's assume he's married filing joint, all of the interest is deductible. They then twisted the facts a little bit. Mary takes out a $500,000 mortgage to buy her main home, and the loan is secured by the same home. He then later on takes out a $250,000 home equity loan on her main home, but she used the proceeds to purchase a vacation home. In this case, the interest on the home equity loan will not be deductible. A third example, Bob takes out a $500,000 mortgage to buy his main home and is secured by the home. He then takes out another $500,000 mortgage to buy a vacation home and it is also um, secured by the vacation home. The interest is deductible, but because the total proceeds um, exceeded the $750,000 limit, the interest is subject to proration between the two homes. Interestingly, there is another cutoff date in the whole mix. Um, it is now December 15, 2017, and what this date means is if you entered into a written binding contract before December 15, 2017, and you plan to close before January 1st, 2018, and for whatever reason you didn't purchase it until April 1st, 2018, you are still grandfathered in under the old $1 million threshold. In the case of a refinancing that happened after December 15, 2017, the threshold follows the original loan and the interest is deductible as long as the debt that's resulted from the refinancing does not exceed the debt that's immediately before the refinance. And after 2025, the old law comes back. Cash and contributions, just, yep. If I could just interject here too, we're seeing a lot of confusion amongst taxpayers and even some mortgage lenders in regards to home equity debt. As Miao mentioned, home equity indebtedness is a specific definition under the Internal Revenue Code, whereas um, in the community, we use home equity lines, you know, second mortgages, home equity debt um, to mean something else. So it's important to understand the tax meaning when you're dealing with these rules. Thank you, Tim. Um, Moving on to cash contributions. The cash contributions is increased from 50% to 60% of your AGI um, limit. The other AGI limitations for contributions are not changed. So now we have um, additional AGI limitation in the mix, which are 60%, 50%, 30%, and 20%. Let's say if your contribution is all cash, 
it's a straightforward 60% AGI limitation. But if you also have gifts that's subject to the 30% limitation, then this limit is first reduced by your cash donations first. Um, let's just take a uh, look at a quick example. Let's say you donated $50,000 cash and $15,000 stocks um, to a 50% charity. Um, your AGI is $200,000, so your cash donation is well under the 60% AGI limitation, which is $120,000. Your stock contribution is subject to the 30% AGI limit, which is $60,000. So in order to compute your deductible contribution, your $60,000 30% AGI is first reduced by your $50,000 cash donation. After that, you're left with a $10,000 that can apply to your stock donation. At the end of the day, 5,000 of your stock donations will be carried over for five years. Another change in this area that has to do with contributions to educational organizations um, in exchange for the right to purchase athletic event seating. This is disallowed under the tax reform. So it may seem like uh, there's a less of incentive to give now with the um, almost double standard deduction. But what you could do is take a look at your annual contribution over two to three year uh, span. If by combining two years contribution into one year will put you over the standard deduction, it might be worth it to bunch two years together to take advantage of the itemized deduction for one year and then take the standard deduction for the next year. Or if you are still under the standard deduction, but you are receiving required minimum distribution, then you can choose to make a tax-free IRA distribution to that charity, um, even though the donation is not deductible, but at least this distribution will be income tax-free to you because it's not included in your income at all. Casualty and staff losses is fairly straightforward. Um, the tax reform now limits the deduction um, for only the federally declared disasters. Uh, they leave the $100 per casualty and 10% AGI limitation unchanged. Um, in the case that you have a personal casualty gain, you're supposed to net your personal casualty gains with the um, federal disaster losses first before applying the $100 per casualty and 10% AGI limitation. The 2% itemized deductions are disallowed, and commonly that includes your tax preparation fees, your investment management fees, um, some unreimbursed employee expenses, and some hobby losses. Another one that's less commonly seen is the excess deduction on the termination from a trust or estate. Um, some executor trustees may choose to defer some fees um, until the final year if the taxable income for any of the prior years is already at a loss. So instead of losing out on this deduction, um, the beneficiary can take it as a 2% deduction on their individual return. However, this planning is gone now. The second poll question is now up again. If you are doing this webinar for CPE credit, you are required to submit an answer to each poll question, including this one. Again, we'll leave this open for about a minute. Just another few seconds on this poll question. Thank you, everybody. 
The last in the itemized deduction series is the P's limitation. Um, a P's limitation is basically the last layer of limitation in the itemized deductions. So for high income earners, if your AGI exceeds a certain threshold, your total itemized deduction is decreased by 3% of that excess of your AGI over that threshold. Luckily, this is gone for 2018 to 2025. Uh, I think this is the end of my slide. I'm gonna turn it to Lauren to go over some other changes covered in the tax reform. And before Lauren starts, I can't help myself by uh, butting in here. Um, as Miao mentioned, there are a lot of changes here to deductions. So when somebody tries to determine whether they're going, they're going to have a tax decrease or increase under the new law, you really have to look at everything. And each person's circumstances are important to, um, to note. So it's, you know, somebody just says, oh, everybody gets a tax decrease here. You really got to look at it a little bit further than that. Lauren? Great, thanks Tim. So let's take a look at some of the other changes that are in the Tax Cuts and Job Act. Some of the changes are taxpayer friendly and some are not so friendly. Um, so let's take them one at a time. The first, first thing I'd like to look at is the college savings plans. They're also called Section 529 plans, which are due to their reference to the Internal Revenue Code. And 529 plans are tax advantage savings plans that are used to save for college, vocational, and post-secondary educational expenses. Some states do offer a nice deduction for contributions to 529 plans. Under the new law, elementary and high school tuition, granted to a maximum of $10,000 per beneficiary, can use 529 plan assets. Now, some states are not adopting these changes. Some states, because they offer such a nice deduction, for contributions to 529 plans, they feel that the 529 plan should be used for long-term growth to save for college. So some of the states are, com are coming out and saying, if you do make distributions from the plans for elementary and high school tuition, something could happen. Either the earnings attributable to those distributions will be taxed in certain states, or the state might not offer as a deduction that a taxpayer would take ordinarily. And the new law, the Section 529 plan assets can also be rolled over to 529 ABLE accounts. 529 ABLE accounts help Americans living with disabilities save for education and other living expenses without a reduction in public benefits. So let's move on to alimony. Alimony under the prior law, alimony and separate maintenance payments was received as income and did to the payee and alimony paid was deductible by the payor. Now this one is delayed for a year and effective after 1231-18, alimony and separate maintenance payments are no longer reportable as income or deductible as an adjustment to income. Child support, um, treat, child support payments will be treated the same. Child support payments were never a taxable event so they never really taxable income when received or it, there was an adjustment to income when paid. And that treatment remains unchanged. So after 1231-18, if there are agreements prior to 1231-18, would need to be modified and accepted by both parties for the new law to apply. So let's move on to the disallowance of excess business losses. This one isn't as taxpayer friendly. The new law defines a new level of limitation for business losses. It's applied after the basis limits and the at-risk limits and the passive loss rules. And it opposes an, another limitation on sole proprietorships and S corporations to utilize a pass-through loss against other income. This is kind of a game changer for, for S corporations and partnerships because it's just another level of of um, limitation that they need to go through in order to deduct losses on their personal income tax return. Let's say a, a pass-through entity like a partnership or an S corporation takes 179 deduction or bonus depreciation on certain assets. Those deductions will be subject to an extra level of limitation. And sometimes that, that is a limitation that we weren't used to in the past. 
We will go through some examples to make this a little bit clearer. A taxpayer's excess business loss for a taxable year is the excess of the taxpayer's aggregate deductions attributable to his trade or business for the year over the sum of the taxpayer's aggregate gross income or gain for the year attributable to such trades or business plus $250,000 or $500,000 in the case of a joint return. Any excess business loss for a taxable year is carried forward and treated as part of the taxpayer's net operating loss. So I think an example might help make this a little bit clearer. Let's take a sole proprietorship. In 2018, T has deductions of $500,000 from a business and it's the gross income from the business is $200,000. I'd like to take a minute and just see the difference if it's a single taxpayer that is reporting this activity compared to a married taxpayer. So the income of $200,000 less deductions of $500,000 produces a loss of $300,000. Now for a single taxpayer, you would take deductions of 500,000 less income of the $200,000 with a limitation of $250,000. And it produces an excess business loss of $50,000. So for a single taxpayer, that $300,000 loss is reduced by the $50,000 excess business loss to produce a deductible loss of $250,000. The $50,000 excess business loss would be carried forward as a net operating loss. Now let's take the same situation and you have a married taxpayer that, produced, that has that same loss of $300,000. When you're calculating the excess business loss, you'll take the deductions of 500,000 less the income of 200,000, but you have a limitation of $500,000. So in a married taxpayer's situation, there isn't any excess business loss and the full $300,000 is deductible. Let's take the example on the right side of the slide where we have a, a taxpayer and a spouse that each have a sole proprietorship. T has deductions of 500,000 from a business and his gross income is $200,000. And the spouse has the same activity. So in total, the income is, is $400,000. Deductions are a million dollars. And the loss reported on a, on a joint tax return is $600,000. If we go through the excess business loss calculation and take the deductions of a million, less income of $400,000 and limitation of $500,000, we'll have an excess business loss of $100,000. So the deductible loss is only $500,000 and $100,000 will be in, incorporated into a net operating loss carryover. So it is kind of a game changer for, for both sole proprietorships and for S corporations or partnerships because it does it stops some of the deductible losses in the past at another level. And you may ask also, uh, with the economy doing well and many businesses doing well, how could this be applicable you know, in the current year? Well, obviously every business is different, but uh, one of the changes that was made, um, or a few changes, were around the depreciation deductions. And that was covered in our corporate webinar. But those um, changes are allowing companies to write off a lot more in their fixed asset um, additions. And as a result, they may be showing losses that are passing through to individual taxpayers. And as Lauren said, those losses now are going to be subject to these, um, to these excess business loss rules. Okay, so now is a great time for poll question three. Again, if you are doing this for CPE credit, this is the final poll question you'll need to answer, so please do so now. Again, we'll have about a, a minute left.
we're going to have just about 10 more seconds here. Great. Thank you, everybody. So let's go on to the elimination of the health insurance penalty, which sounds like good news. Um, the, the, the law as it stands right now, there is a, if you don't carry minimum essential coverage or qualify for an exemption, there is a fear of a penalty for not having health insurance for most of the year. The new law eliminates a tax penalty for Americans who don't obtain health insurance. However, it does not take effect until after December 31st, 2018. Taxpayers will continue to receive the 1095A, B, and C forms, which report health insurance coverage, as these reporting requirements were not eliminated under the new act. Okay, let's move on to the moving expense deduction. Under the prior law, if an employer pays for a worker's moving expenses due to a, a new job or relocation, some of those expenses paid on behalf of the employee were excluded from their gross the employee's wages. Or if an, a taxpayer relocated to start a new job, which is a certain number of miles away from his old residence to, his, to the new position, he could claim some of the moving expenses on their personal income tax return. Under the new law, the movie expense tax free treatment is suspended if the business pays for the moving costs. And, and unfortunately, the movie expense deduction on the taxpayer's personal income tax return is also disallowed through 2025. The new law does not apply for active duty military members. So companies are trying to come up with creative ways to attract employees if movie expenses will be taxable to their workers. Let's go over the carried interest provisions. Um, don't really apply to many taxpayers, but it received a lot of attention during the House and Senate committee conferences. Um, the carried interest is a portion of the investment funds paid to investment managers that are eligible for long-term capital gain treatment. It applies to private equity, hedge funds, and venture capitalists. So if the hedge fund managers are eligible for long-term capital gain treatment, a lot of people were discouraged by that because regular wages are subject to ordinary income tax treatment. The new tax law increases the holding period of assets sold eligible for long-term capital gain treatment from one year to three years. And assets held under three years when sold will be subject to short-term capital gain rates. So some, sometimes the private equity and hedge fund managers won't all have all their income subject to long-term capital gain rates. Yeah, I've been seeing the clock here uh, Congress for quite a while, and some people were disappointed with the outcome here because it's it's just a, a watered-down um, solution to uh, what they considered to be the problem. They were looking to have it all taxed at ordinary income tax rates. So on the next slide, let's talk about qualified equity grants. Non-statutory stock options granted are generally taxable upon the exercise of the option if the recipient receives fully vested stock. Incentive stock options or options under an employee stock purchase plan are not included. And restricted stock units that are exempt from or comply with the non-qualified deferred compensation rules aren't taxable until the delivery of the vested stock. So under the new rules, a qualified employee can elect to defer the income attributable to a stock option or a restricted stock unit received in connection with the performance of services for up to five years if the corporation stock is an eligible corporation. Okay, let's talk about Roth IRA conversion recharacterizations. Um, a traditional IRA or a qualified plan can be converted into a Roth IRA. The conversion needs to be done prior to December 31st. Under prior law, if the taxpayer did not have adequate liquidity to repay the tax on the conversion, a recharacterization could undo the conversion. The tax reform bill has removed the ability to recharacterize any Roth IRA conversions done in 2018 and thereafter. The exit now, that this is only if, if you convert during the year and then you find out that you don't have enough 
money to pay the tax at the end of the year, you can change your mind. Um, that is no longer that no longer applies. But if you end up convert if you end up contributing to a Roth IRA in the beginning of the year and you realize at the end of the year that you are not eligible to contribute to a Roth, the excess contributions to a Roth can be recharacterized to a regular IRA to avoid the penalty for contributing to the to the Roth. So that's not affected. It's just if you make a conversion, you find that you you can't afford the tax to to pay the tax on the conversion. You can no longer change your mind before the due date of the return. Yeah, and what a lot of taxpayers were doing is they were doing the conversion, and then they had an extended period of time to unconvert or to undo the conversion, and they were looking at the stock market. So if you did a conversion at one date and then the stock market went down, well, now you've paid taxes on value that you no longer have in the Roth account. So therefore, they would want to undo the transaction, and this is what Congress has taken away. Okay, so there's been an extension of a lot of expiring provisions. After the Tax Cut and Jobs Act was passed, there was an extension um, act that was that was passed by the end of December, where a few of the um, extensions were extended. Um, and they're only good for 2017. The exclusion from gross income of discharge of qualified personal resident indebtedness was extended for 2017. Uh, mortgage insurance premiums treated as qualified residence interest was also extended. The above the line deduction for qualified tuition and related expenses um, fell under the, these expiring provisions and the various energy credits were also extended at the end of December. So that wraps up the other items of our Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Yeah, so we have a few questions coming in, and if anyone else has any additional questions, feel free to submit them in the questions tab uh, in, your, in your webinar uh, portal there. The, the first question we have is, why did Congress decide to eliminate the deduction for alimony? Yeah, so I think what they found, I'll, I'll take this one, um, is that because it was deductible by the payer and includable in the income of the recipient, the IRS was finding that there were far more taxpayers taking the deduction than including it in income. So there was a matching issue. And, and although you had to report the recipient's um, identification number on the payer's tax return, it was costing the IRS some time and aggravation to track down and try to get the, um, uh, the, the tax on the income from the recipient. So that was part of the simplification, if you will, so that you wouldn't have to go through that um, process. You know, um, you know, it really does change the economics of getting divorced, and that's part of the reason why the effective um, um, period or the effective time uh, frame for that is for 2019 going forward because it gives people uh, more of a chance to figure that all out um, because if you can't deduct the alimony well then you can't afford to pay as much and vice versa if it's not taxable um, you know you could afford probably to live on less great thanks Tim and it looks like we have one more question here and the question is uh, I thought this tax reform was supposedly all about tax simplification. Does that mean I'll be able to file my 2018 federal individual income tax return on a, a so-called postcard? Well, if you can figure out how to do that, Jared, you can certainly prepare my return. Um, but it's that's not the case. There are actually a lot of areas where there is simplification. Um, I guess the al the alimony one is one. Uh, the the kitty tax that we talked about before is another one. Uh, Miao talked about the increase in the standard deduction. For some taxes, will be simplification because they won't have to keep track of of certain of their um, itemized deductions. So there is some simplification. But on the other end, they've just put us. Uh, they put in this big uh, qualified business income deduction, which is one of the more complicated parts of the law that you'll ever see. Um, and there are other things in there, too. So, you know, all in all, yes, a little bit of simplification, but nobody's going to be able to file on a on a postcard. You still have to pay the regular the forms and 
and work with the rules that are in place. Great. So I, I think that wraps up the questions we had. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Uh, and the recording slides will be sent out tomorrow morning. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, and we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you.